So let me start again. So this is the work done by two of my PhD students and in collaboration with Trunk Wing Ma and Norbert Lutkenhaus. Uh, my kind of long title tells you half of the story, so I can go straight to the point. Uh, wanted is the perfect quantum memory. For those of us in working on quantum repeaters, we perhaps want them to be efficiently coupled to light. The, we want them to have low error gate operation for uh, purification that we may need. Uh, long coherence time, of course, uh, and then, of course, short access time so that we can repeat that process with a faster rate. And we need many of them. And if I can still continue to wish for something, I would ask to, to have it at low prices. Uh, this talk is not about quantum repeaters, luckily. But what I want to get out of this long list of this long wish list is we don't probably yet have such a memory, as far as I know. But does that mean that all the tremendous effort by the memory community, which has made a lot of progress, is, is, is kind of wasted? Or is this, shall we still wait for that perfect memory before doing something useful? And I'm trying to find an example in which I, I, I introduce a certain system by, by, in which by adding this imperfect quantum memories of today's technology, we can possibly get some advantage. And that's my benchmark for usefulness. So the example that we have in mind is based on the, the measurement device independent QKD. For those of you who attended Joshua's uh, tutorial, a very nice tutorial, uh, you already know about them. So what we are going to do is we add memories to this MDI QKD. We call them memory assisted MDI QKD. And then I go over a historical evolution of our research to find out uh, what setup would offer what advantage and what requirement it has and I compare it with the state of the art with what we can do. So let me just give a brief overview of MDI QKD. So most of you are familiar with the original EPR protocol. You have an EPR source, send entangled photons to Alice and Bob. They do the measurement. They get the key out. Equivalent to that would be the entanglement swapping protocol. Instead of uh, having the EPR so at the middle, we give it to Alice and Bob. They send one of the photons to the middle station. They do a ballast state measurement that effectively swaps the entanglement between these two photons. They do the gain the measurement. They can extract the key. In this scheme, if they first do the measurement, it could, uh, I, well, you can, you can think of that the, the state of this state at the output of EPR. So it's like a BB84 encoded photon. So we can alternatively do just use a BB84 encoder, send the photon, do the ballast state measurement, and we get the same thing. So this, the original idea was presented, well, was proposed by Biham et al. in 96, and then the more modern version with more practicality considered into it was uh, proposed by Lowe and others, and independently by Bronstein and Pirandola. So the, the system that I'm focusing more on is the one proposed by Lowe. Hertie and key. Uh, it was mentioned, it has lots of advantages. It's resilient to detector attacks. Uh, it's perhaps suitable for access network because our users only need the source part of a QKD setup and not the costly measurement, it seems. And uh, we can do this measurement with the typical linear optics devices and photo detectors. But in terms of key rate, and in order to get a successful ballast state measurement, we need both photons sent by Alice and Bob survive the path loss. So in my notation, the key rate would scale with eta square, where eta is the loss in one of these legs. So what we are going to do is we're going to add memories to this system. And this has been independently proposed by uh, Dagmar Bruce group in Dusseldorf and, and our group with, with others. And what we are going to do is uh, before doing the ballast state measurement, we, we, we we use two quantum memories. And the idea is now the new protocol would run like that, that we, we, Alice and Bob is still repeatedly send photons. At, for each photon, we attempt to store that photon in these quantum memories. As soon as one of them succeeds, we wait until, and wait until the other user also stores his photon. And once both photons are loaded into their corresponding memories, we do the middle ballast state measurement. Implicit in this formulation and this setup, which I refer to as setup A in this talk, is that there is a heralding mechanism by which I can tell whether the photon was stored or not. I will get back to this issue later. So for now, relax and think of other things. 
So what's the main advantage? The main advantage is the same thing that we expect to get in quantum repeaters. Now I don't need the two photons arrive together. I can store one of them and then wait for the other one to be stored later. And the advantage would be that uh, if you just calculate the same argument that we have for quantum repeaters, the key rate would now scale with eta rather than eta squared. So ideally, I would expect that if this is how my key rate would scale with distance without memories, with this setup, I would expect it to scale with a slower slope. And therefore, from some distances onward, I should have some key rate advantage. Well, there is a question mark in front of that. And that is, uh, well, if you're familiar with how memories work and why we don't have a quantum repeater yet, is the legitimate question to ask is, well, quantum memories are not perfect. For instance, they, you, you have to deal with the, the coherence of such, such systems. And your R setup is not an exception. It, ha it has to deal with the same problem. So what's the deal that we, we claim that, OK, we may get an advantage with this system, but not with repeater at the, at the moment, with, with current existing uh, state of the art? So for instance, the typical uh, dephasing or amplitude decay, these are the things that we have to consider for a practical memory system. So, What's the advantage over a repeater setup? That's a bit subtle. But there is one easy advantage, and that's in terms of practicality. And that is that our users do not need to have a uh, near zero degrees of Kelvin memory in, in their home. So that's the advantage. One advantage is we don't need memories at the far end of the system. But the more subtle and more interesting advantage is in terms of requirement that this setup has for the memory as compared to a simple repeater setup. Now let me explain it to you. So in a repeater, this is a, just a simple single node repeater setup. In this setup, if you want to entangle these two memories, for instance, you attempt according to a certain entanglement distribution scheme. And then you have to wait a time equivalent to L0 over C for the classical signal to tell you whether that attempt was successful or not. And then you can repeat again if it wasn't. So in terms of waiting time or attempt period, you are limited by distance. And correspondingly, the coherence time that you need for your memory is scales with distance. How is it different in our scheme? Uh, within our scheme, we do it slightly differently. We, what we do is we repeatedly send photons by Alice and Bob. For each photon, we have some time to store that photon into memory, some time to verify whether it was stored, and perhaps some preparation time or initialization time if it, the, the attempt wasn't successful. If I add them together and call this writing time, I can repeat my protocol at the rate corresponding to the writing time of my memories. And if this writing time happens to be short, then I get an advantage. Now the required coherence of my memories kind of scales with this writing time, as well as distances still. So if we do the exact calculation, we get this promise that in terms of the required coherence time for the quantum memories, in our memory-assisted MDIQKD, as compared to a traditional conventional quantum repeater setup. If you have memories with, let's say, writing time short as one nanosecond, then for instance, at 400 kilometers of distance, you have an advantage of something on the order of three orders of magnitude. So if, if we need millisecond, now we can work it with microsecond. That's the idea. And that looks promising at the moment. So let's see. Uh, what are the requirements? Uh, if I actually look at the main objective of the, 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 the project, that we wanted to beat a no memory system. So let me compare it in terms of key rate with an ideal BB84 system. And for the memory, the only source of non-ideality is the dephasing process. So it turns out that I actually, in order to properly beat my ideal BB84 scheme, I need a large ratio of T2, which is the coherence time, and T, which is the repetition period, or ideally the writing time of the memory. And that makes sense. That basically says that if you go to longer distances, your photon chance of arrival would be less. So we need a larger ratio between coherence time and the repetition period to get. This is equivalent to what we, we know as storage bandwidth product for quantum memory. So what it says that for this scheme, for this setup A, I need memories which, have, which should have large storage bandwidth products. There is something unfair on this graph, which I don't know if you noticed that. I have plotted the key rate per pulse. And it is unfair because my 
BB80 for system, I can drive it with rather high repetition rate, like a gigahertz or so. Whereas with, with my memory system, I'm limited by this writing time issue. So a proper, a better way of comparing the system is if I look at the, in the total key generation rate, not just per pulse, but what I get at the end of the day. And then uh, if I do that, so this is at one gigahertz for the BB84, but at uh, writing time repetition period for the memory system, I, realize I get back the same requirement. I need short access times. It doesn't mean I get the same result, but basically what it means, I can tick two boxes with one with, by meeting one requirement. If I have short access time, not only the required coherence time for my memory would be lower, but also that I can also beat potentially a no QM, no memory based QK this system. Just remember the kind of scales of number like a thousand for the storage bandwidth product, 10,000, and then nanosecond, 10 nanosecond for, the, for this writing time. These are kind of harsh to achieve, but let's see if we can do that. Uh, well, let me get back to the original requirement of my scheme, which I skipped intentionally, and that was that our memory in this setup must be heralding. I have to be able to verify whether I have stored something or not. And the problem is the type of memories by which I can directly do that, like single atom trapped in a cavity, are very slow in terms of this verification process. These are like in the order of millisecond, and I need nanosecond. So can we do something about it? Uh, sure we can. So let me introduce you to our setup B in which the heralding process is being done indirectly in the sense that now instead of we store something directly into the memory, we entangle a photon with the memory and do a teleportation. So with this side ballast state measurements here and there, I can simply teleport the state of Alice and Bob to their respective memories if these side ballast state measurements are successful. This way my writing time slightly changes. Now we have to replace the storing time with entangling time but that's typically much faster. So for instance, uh, the, the, it has been demonstrated already for different setups, including the single atoms in, in a cavity, as well as like atomic ensemble-based systems. And, well, these are sigmas. Uh, and, uh, well, we, we, can, we can basically check if either of this system would provide me with that advantage of beating a no-memory system. So let's start. Uh, uh, what basically I'm, I've, we have done in our work, in our paper, which I don't, I'm not going to explain in detail, is we have tried to include m many sources of imperfections, as many, well, as many as we could and it typically exist in realistic experiments. It's not exhaustive, for sure, but, but it includes anything. So it has dephasing, decay, dark count, background noise, uh, your writing, reading inefficiencies, your, the, the corresponding timing issues, what is the reading time, what is the writing time, etc. And we tried to see if we, any of the existing memories would actually satisfy the conditions that we want. So I start with the single atoms in a cavity. This is based on the work uh, done by the group of Professor Rompe in Germany. Uh, I've uh, basically taken the experimental results, the parameters of their quantum memory, which is a single atom in a cavity, and I've tried to see what key rate I can get for my memory-assisted MDIQKD. So if I go with what exactly is in the paper, and I even a bit make it more optimistic, for instance, in the writing time they have, I say, 21 microseconds, whereas it actually you need something like 100 microseconds for cooling your atoms. Uh, I assume we don't need to do it every cycle, so let's relax that one. But even if I kind of improve their parameters, what I get is this curve A. Let's see how much improvement we need to actually beat my no memory system, which is being run at one gigahertz. And I'm, for all system, I'm assuming I'm using the kind of NIST uh, superconductor photodetector with high efficiency and low dark count. System B, let's first short the uh, writing time to one microsecond. Doesn't, well, makes it better, but not yet. And the main reason is this T2 over T is still low, it's 100. So let's make it bigger, let's make T2 one second. St very large number, still I'm short. I eventually need to make this writing time shorter than one microsecond to, to go over the, after 300 kilometer I go over the 
no memory system. But there is room for improvement then. Uh, and this is not, this is just an example. So one can check the same thing with NV centers, with, with uh, quantum dots, for instance, that we had the talk before, the day before. It seems, it seems the main problem for this single atom-based, single excitation-based memories is their writing time. It's not too short. It's not short enough for us. Uh, how about the ensemble-based memories? Well, it uh, seems much more promising in that ground. If you look at the existing uh, memories that we have, for so this is an example of a room temperature atomic ensemble. It's a bandwidth of one gigahertz. They write into this memory with 300 picosecond short pulses. Or the work of like Titus and others on these multi-mode memories, we are we're always dealing with very large bandwidths, which means that the, in principle, the writing time could be as short as something on the order of sub-nanosecond, which is what we want. So is that good enough? Do we, do, we have, do we have the courage to see what we get? Well, this is what we get. Uh, if you put, again, do the same thing. So I'm, I'm plotting the key rate now for different values of excitation probability. So with atomic ensemble, the way it works is you have to pump this ensemble in such a way that with some small probability p, one of the atoms would undergo a Raman transition and you get one excited atom. That's ideally what you want. But what you don't want, but it happens anyway, is sometimes with this probability p squared, you get two of these atoms go up. And again, in the same way with higher order terms. So what actually makes this system never beat the no memory system is the influence of these p2 terms. It turns out that if I start with p like 10 to the minus 2, well, OK, I have a large number of these two photon components. And that would bring me down before I actually beat the no memory system. If I reduce the p so that the multiple to the two photon components become less, well, I can go farther distance, but again, before beating the no memory system, I fall down. And the same everywhere. So basically, I cannot beat within the setup B of my system, I cannot improve the key rate. I cannot beat the no memory system. Well, if I don't know how much time we have, but if if there is, in the question time, I think there is a simple explanation why, why this has happened. Okay, so let me, let me go, how can we get around this problem? So let me introduce the setup C, by which we can get rid of the ensemble effect, uh, get rid of the multiple excitation effect. So how this works is, suppose you have an ideal EPR source, okay? Then ideal EPR source would only generate one pair of entangled photons. And if I store one of these photons into the memory and do the other one, use the other one for the teleportation idea, then it doesn't matter whether my memory is ensemble-based or not because I'm just storing one photon in it. And that means that I don't care about the multiple excitation issue. Okay? So there is a big if. I need a good EPR source. So for instance, if in this scheme you use the, parametric, the typical parametric downconvergence sources, that wouldn't help because those still generate multiple photons with the same statistics as my atomic ensemble would have. What we need, perhaps, is a quantum dot-based EPR source, which are not yet fully mature, but they, they are very promising. They have shown a very low uh, G2 value at a very rather high single pair generation rate, and you can drive them at a very high rate. And these are all the characteristics that we want. One other key advantage of this system, this setup, is what I call delayed writing. How does it work? Well, here we don't need to write every single pair of photons into the memory. We just need to write those for which we've got the trigger from the ballast state measurement. And what is the advantage is the, that overhead time for cooling and preparing your memory, which is typically long, now doesn't really matter much. Because every now and then that I get a click here, I just need a, a, a ready memory to use. And therefore, what that means is that the, the, the repetition rate for this setup doesn't, isn't fully dependent on the writing time anymore. So I can use memories which are slower, but have better characteristics. Well, last thing for memory community, if you're part of them, with this setup, our memories are good enough. It is the source which has, needs to be improved. 
Okay, so we can wait until the source community gives us the right if you are sourced, and then we can do this experiment. On that day, on that day, uh, we can actually get a good Im improvement. Uh, so this is assumed that your entangled state are ideal. I have started curve A is the, the room temperature atomic ensemble. And if I improve it to curve C, this is something that you can do with cold atomic ensemble today. This is already done. And what you get is an improvement over a distance between nearly 200 to 500 kilometers. So I can beat my no memory system with setup C, provided, I, provided that I have a EPR source which doesn't have multiple excitation. Okay, so uh, let me summarize. But before that, if you're interested, uh, I said all the good things about this scheme. One drawback is it's not a scalable. If you want to go to farther distances, eventually you have to combine it with a quantum repeater setup. And if you're interested, uh, we have this work done which calculates all the details about that. So let me summarize. Uh, so I started with the idea that I want to beat no memory based system by adding memories to them but those memories are imperfect, are of the same quality that we have today. So we started with setup A, we realized that the requirements are rather high, the memories need to be heralding, they have to have short access time and large storage bandwidth products. I moved on to setup P, uh, that relaxed the heralding requirement, but still the other two must, must be satisfied. Uh, it turns out the ensemble based memories are not suitable for this setup because of the multiple excitation issue. And the way to get around that is to replace this entangling process here by using a nearly ideal EPR source, which doesn't have two pairs issue. It could, it could be inefficient, but it shouldn't have that many two photon pairs. And then uh, it turns out that the, uh, the timing uh, requirements would be even relaxed, so the writing team doesn't need to be, again, sub-nanosecond or something. It could be longer. And altogether, the promise is if if not, before we get to actually build a functional quantum repeater, we can perhaps look at this protocol as a middle step along the roadmap toward a functional long distance QTKD system because it requires milder requirements on our system component. Well, let me thank you. I'm happy to have this. What's the effect if you can do a, some sort of a probabilistic or weak Q and D measurement on all of this, where you could get some partial heralding? Well, that's a good question. There is actually a proposal for that. So basically, you can replace the memories with a bank of uh, sources and this Q and D measurement, which gives you exactly what to say. So basically, that heralding comes from the Q and D measurement. But the good thing about that the scheme is. This scheme is one, you can think of this, oops, you can th think of this idea as one way of implementing that Q and D measurement. Right, so if you, suppose you don't have the quantum memory, you just have many of these sources, many of these EPR BSMs, and then as soon as this BSM clicks, that means that one of these photons is entangled, is, is, has teleported, has been, has, has the information of Alice, you have, you use a switch, and send that photon to the middle of the state. Does, doesn't that require you know that you only have one photon coming from the source, not, a, not an attenuated coherent state? Because you could have two photons coming and still get a double click at the beam splitter. So you don't necessarily know you have well, one EPR. And well, one. we can probably deal with that with the same decoy state technique. So in our scheme, that we don't need to use all the, well, I, all the results I showed was for the single photon source, okay. but we have the result for the decoy state as well, and it works with the same typical gap that you get between single photon and the coil state. Okay. So. Uh, I noticed that in the graphs you have a, a, a key rate per pulse. I was just wondering if it's to get key rate in bits per second, it's, uh, is it just dividing by the symbol duration or is it more complicated than that? Uh. Oh, and sorry, I, I think it was a previous graph that had uh, per pulse. Right? This one? Um, Maybe the first set up A, one? maybe? Uh, yeah, this one, I think. Yeah, this one, I, well, it doesn't matter. No, but it's not more complicated than that. But because we don't get any advantage per pulse, I don't expect to get any advantage for the total rate. That's the idea. 